My name's Faith Babington and um, I'm a sculptor. Um, I wanted to be a sculptor from when I was about six, when I first got my hands on a piece of clay, basically. I was, I was like, that's what I want to do. And I pretty much stuck to it, really. So I'm creating a, two pieces here, a orangutan and a tiger for just to make, make them for, um, for saving environment. So I'm using palm oil products here to put all over the tiger. Um, and so the kids can interact with it in their education centre. Um, which they go to, I think it's mainly junior junior children, um, but Chester Zoo have a regular ongoing uh, workshops with them about palm oil. So that's what it's for. When I was um, a baby, I was in a, a foster home. When I was born, straight from when I was born, I went into a, um, a, 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 what is it, Dr. Bernardo's. And it was a big old, old mansion and there must have been about 30 babies in it. It was specifically for babies, from babies to five, I think, or six, I'm not sure. That was, that's uh, the children that were there. Um, so yeah, I, I was born there, and I, I wasn't born there, I was born in Belper, which is dead, dead near, just down the road. And it was Morley Manor, so it was a state home in the middle of nowhere. I found out though that my mum, um, my mum, I, Dr. Minardo's had given me a sheet of paper about my history and th through the, the way it was written I'd worked out that I was a product of a rape and um, I went to social services to get some more bits of paper, letters and things that, that she'd written um, and I remember that it was after adoption and the woman in after adoption was sort of so like, I thought what's wrong with her, she was like really being tiptoey around me and I thought I know, she sussed out that I'm a product of a rape and she doesn't know if I know. And she was freaking out about telling me. But I already knew, I'd already sussed it, you know. And I also had a really good mate, one of my best mates at college, a boy, I yeah, was a product of a rape. Um, but he had a really hard time getting his head around that. But I think it was because he was a boy and his mum saw his, the rapist in him. And I think that, that was much harder in that way. You know, anyway, when I was old enough, we went to the local primary school, which was one of those primary schools where there's one, one teacher at the head and at the head of the room, and everyone's sitting in rows, like, a, like in a hall, and that's the school. And uh, I remember being taken up. There was quite a lot of, you know, there was a little cluster of adopted children, um, uh, foster children, and, um, you know, from the home. And we were all sort of known anyway, we were all, we were all naughty, obviously. I always up at the headmasters in front. And in those days they whipped you and slippered you. It was not good. It was hard. Black people in the middle of Derbyshire. There was just no hope, was there? <laughs> we were just like stuck out like sore thumbs. The little cluster was maybe four or five of us, I think. There were black black children. Yeah, I remember um, in the children's home as well. There was there was a little boy called Dean. I remember him really well, and a little co boy called Vincent. And Vincent, he was really smart actually. Vincent, we used to call him Professor because we were five, you know, six, seven, that kind of age. We used to call him Professor. I don't know why, just because he was quite smart, but then he would always have butter on his head. I mean, it's stupid, isn't it? You, will, you bang into a door and you, they put butter on your head. Anyway, they did. He was always banging into doors. I don't know why. Um, and then there was Dean, who was my mate, who was naughty. I mean, Dean got into a lot of trouble, stealing money and, um, well, just being not very nice. I was fostered a couple of times in Bernardo's and then I went back. And then my mum, my who adopted me in the end, um, she was a teacher, taught teachers to teach. And she'd adopted a girl, uh, a girl before my sister. She'd adopted before my sister was 21. So she was getting off to college and doing her thing. And my sister was going, oh, adopt another child, adopt another child. And my mum had been visiting me anyway, because um, she was sort of, you know, how they befriend children in the home and the 
sometimes they'd take them out and they'd give them presents and that sort of thing. So my mum had been doing that with me for a little while anyway. And then um, she adopted me eventually when I was about 10. Um, and it was really her really, even though I called her a tyrant and I think she was a bit of a tyrant. You know, she was 50 when she adopted me, which was too old, single woman. Um, that was hard, you know. But um, she'd adopted a child before, hadn't she? And Beb was not adopted until she was 16. And she was um, an elected mute. She had a hard time. Um, and then she, she went away to college and then my mum adopted me. Um, and she was, she was like, oh, I'm too old, I'm too old. But she did in the end. She was in her, fifth, in her late 40s, early 50s when she adopted me. Because she was born in 1915. So she lived through those two wars and she was a teacher, a te teacher who taught teachers to teach. Um, so her, her focus was education, basically. And um, she wasn't, she found it hard to be loving. She wasn't, she wasn't a particularly loving kind of person. But having said that, I wouldn't be here today without her. You know, she, she, um, she wanted to give, it was her way of giving charity basically, instead of giving charity to somebody unknown, you know, adopting was her way of giving charity, like, 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 um, you know, in Victoria times they did that, didn't they? You know, it was, it was a way of giving back, um, more personally. I wouldn't be where I was today without her, really. And it was her introduction, because she was in the teacher training college and I was in the school attached to it. Derby, Derby, Derby College School, I think it was junior school. And my mum used to, because she finished at five, we finished at three, half three. I used to go into the art room in the college and the art teacher used to let me muck around with things. And that was my first introduction to clay. And I think I was about six or seven. And that was it, I was hooked. I made a, a head in clay and I cast it in um, plaster, which was fantastic. I think I must have been about 12 or 13 then. I was in a middle school, so yeah, I probably was, wasn't I? I went to a lot of primary schools, in and out of primary schools, because I was a little bit naughty. I just, I used to do really mad things, like my t the teacher would call me and I used to just walk in a straight line through the classroom to the teacher like and disrupt everybody through the desk everything through the chairs and it was it was just a i think it was just a cry for attention yeah it was definitely i used to do really stupid things like that and um yeah i nearly killed a kid once actually when i was um in primary school and they were all because there was what the only black kid in this little village school and it was like oh, i did my head in and um they all sort of ganged up in me, with, on me in the, um, in the, where they change, you know, where they hang up the coats and stuff. But in the back of that was a little woodworking area. And uh, anyway, they cornered me and I sort of backed up into this woodworking area. And this boy who was like the ringleader said to me, like, if, if you, something, if you don't walk past me or something, then I'm going to hit you or something, I don't know. And I was like, nah, I don't think so. So I picked up a hammer and I smashed him in the head with his hammer right in front of me. And I've never seen, you. it's a memory that will always stick with me for life. Someone's head being cracked open like an egg. It was just not good. But he did survive, thank God. <laughs> they just shit me out of that school, yeah. In the end, I went to uh, a boarding school, a sort of, uh, in fact, a local authority paid me to go to a, a boarding school um, because, um, because I'm really dyslexic and I've got very mild cerebral palsy as well and my mum being teacher teacher she sort of like pushed and got the authority to pay for me to go to a, a private school basically but it was an unusual private school you know we had a farm on it we had an art department had a music department and they focused on the arts and um, I spent most of my time on the farm or in the art room and the teachers encouraged you to do that in fact the first my first love of fiberglass resin came from my school because we made a canoe. I mean, 
who makes a, your own canoe in a school hey it's just amazing and fiberglass i mean they don't they don't do those kind of things anymore but in my day they did it was great it was just surreal really um it was there were some surreal events that happened and when i look back on it it was quite surreal you know they used to do things like lock you in cupboards and lock you in the bathroom if you're disruptive at night and things like that just little not it wasn't as bad as some people's homes but it it was it was you know when you were when you're between naught and five your whole personality is developed and when you haven't got someone to cuddle you or pick you up when you cry or make a fuss of you you know or even torture you know that's going to affect your development isn't it it does affect your development and confidence I think the biggest thing that I think people who have been in care have a problem with is confidence and um, they have to find their way of getting that and that can take a lot longer than um, you know a lot of other people but people I know have been in care who found that confidence of something that they do and something that they're good at then they get they surpass all the bullshit that happens before growing up because there was a lot of a lot of stupid things that I did I did kick off rather a lot um, and thank God for boarding school to be honest because those delicate ages between 13 and six, 16, 17, 18 I was in boarding school you know, went to bed at half past ten, got up at six. You know, it was a, it was that kind of regime. So, I think that was my saving grace, really. My teacher at boarding school, she was, she had my back. And then I had a teacher in a, I went to Derby High School, which was a little posh school, um, and for a little while. And a teacher there, in fact, until the day she died, we used to sort of Christmas cards. Um, yeah. So I had I had a couple of teachers who were influential, but friends. Nah, no, not until I went to college did I make really good friends. In school, I wasn't very liked really. I was too, too um, erratic, shall we say, for most people. <laughs> I had a year, I think, a year and a half or something, at a secondary modern in Lincolnshire, which was a nightmare. And um, somebody said to me, don't be another statistic. You know, you know, that's where you're heading, you're going to be another statistic. And that, that really turned me around in my head. I don't know why. It's just something, those little words, you know, sometimes it just, it's just something somebody says can sort of trigger enough t to make you just get your act together, basically. I think, I think the hardest thing for me was being, was being gay because, you know, I was disabled. I had when I was a child, I had my leg in plaster for probably on and off for two years. And, and um, yeah, and being, being black in a rural place is not very easy. And, um, but I said, and being a woman, being female is not easy. And then, of course, being gay is just like icing on the cake, really, wasn't it? It was just hard, hard getting my head round being gay was the hardest thing I think because I could hide being gay you couldn't I couldn't really hide any of the other isms I think I was I was 30 I think I was got my shit together a bit when I was 30 um and it took I thought that was took, that was quite a long time to get my act together but um no I, I think it's something that's always with you it's not something that you know it's it's part of who you are isn't it I think it's 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 it colours everything I do in my life and you know I'm lucky that I found a profession that I love and I can make I've made a success of enough to have a living which is you know the best that you could possibly hope for I think for me I think just be positive in everything you do because at the end of the day you on this life to make to 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 make an impression do something and to do that you have to be positive and have try and have confidence positivity confidence and faith <laughs> I think having a focus makes all the difference you know it's good if you've got a focus and then you can just focus on that and keep going back to it and keep focusing on that keep your focus 
don't be swayed and then and then if you keep going and keep going at it hopefully then then um, things move things happen